So most of you are probably wondering who I am and why I'm qualified to be up here. So I'll tell you all a little bit about myself before we get started. Uh, again, my name is Aaron Jones. I work for the Chandler Police Department and I am a computer programmer. Uh, I have a master's degree in uh, intelligence analysis with a focus in cybersecurity. And in addition to that, I am registered here in Arizona as a subject matter expert in digital forensics. And then in addition to that, uh, I can actually tell you that I am one of the individuals who got to sign the EFF statement that was uh, sent up to kind of explain some of the technical flaws in the FCC's notices and rulemaking that they were attempting to do. Uh, and this is all in uh, relation to net neutrality. In addition to that, um, I'm also a teacher at Mesa Community College, and I teach uh, cybersecurity and Linux and other subjects, and uh, just sort of the, an endless list of things that I do and participate in. But uh, tonight, we're going to be looking at five main performance objectives, but we're going to discuss a whole bunch of extra stuff than just what's here. But uh, I like to always make sure that we at least have five things that we're going to walk away from from this location with its new. So the first thing that we're going to talk about is how to identify a method you can use to better manage your money while shopping. Um, and I'm sorry, I kind of jumped the gun here. For those of you who have devices and would like to follow along, whether it be your cell phone, your laptop, anything like that, you can go to retro64.xyz. And that's my personal web page. That's where I keep all of my lessons. And you can actually go there and you can follow along with this exact, uh, it'll actually look just like this. And so you can follow along with that if you'd like to do so. But of course, I'm going to have everything up here as well, so nobody's going to get lost. So we're going to identify a method you can use to better manage your money while shopping. Our number two objective is going to be to identify a method to stay out of trouble spots during the holiday. We're going to identify a way to make the most of your money this season. We're going to identify what a skimmer is, and we're going to talk about skimmers. And then we're going to identify a method to easily spot scams. And just to, to give you a, a broader introduction, um, holiday, holiday times are great opportunities to find deals, to go shopping, to have a good time with friends and relatives. But it's also a really good time for thieves, bandits, all those people to come out and try to take advantage of you. They're looking for opportunities to be able to gain access to your bank account, to your credit card information, to uh, your personal data on a whole. Because really, nowadays, it's our personal data that really makes who we are. And uh, I don't want anybody here to be an easy target. I want to make sure that we do everything that we possibly can to prevent them from being able to gain access to these items. So we need to pay attention to our physical, our mental, and our digital security during the holidays. And we need to do our best to reduce our chances of becoming a victim because you're going to be the first line of defense in your own security. So number one item, physical security-wise, is no cash. Okay, We need to try to avoid using cash or carrying cash. You want to reduce your possible loss in the event that something occurs to you. And in this day and age, it is much easier to recover digital money than it is for you to recover cash. Um, and there are very, very few places nowadays that require cash, and even fewer that have that cash discount. There's, there's very few places that you can go into and say, well, if I pay for this with, with cash, can I get it for less? Um, that's nearly extinct. So it's not really worth that hassle or the danger of carrying cash. So you might be thinking to yourself, well, what do I do? What do I do without cash? Here are some of the products that are available to you. We have Apple Pay. We have Android Pay. We have Samsung Pay. We have PayPal. And we have credit cards. Now, PayPal, let's touch on that because at 522 today, just before this started, I started getting emails. And somebody was using my PayPal card. And they were in San Diego, and they were making purchases. And I will actually pull out my phone right now and tell you exactly where they went and what they bought. And isn't that ironic? 
that the, the person teaching the class can get up here and tell you. So our very first purchase was made at 5.20 p.m. and they went to Trujillo's Taco Shop in San Diego, California and spent $45. And then they went to a 7-Eleven and bought $30 in gas. And then they went back to Trujillo's and bought another $3.50 in something. And uh, right around 6-11, I got an email from PayPal saying, hey, we finally canceled your card. Okay? So I can tell you right now, I haven't used that card in about a year and a half. Haven't touched it. That card has been sitting at my home in a secure location with no access to it. But at some point, I used it, and it was kept in a database somewhere, and they kept the card number, and they kept the number that's used for the security code on the back, and they kept the expiration date, all the things that they're not supposed to do, and it's set in a database somewhere, and eventually somebody gained access to it, and then they went out and they sold that data. And for those of you who have ever come to one of my earlier courses, like the ones on dark markets, we, I actually showed where they go to make those purchases, to go out and buy PayPal accounts and to buy credit card information and all of that stuff. We've discussed this before, and it just so happens that at some point that happened. And if you notice, I'm not super visibly upset because guess what? It's happened to the best of them. I can tell you about Bangladesh and the, the nearly $2 billion that Bangladesh lost after somebody gained access to their account numbers and started sending uh, ACH requests to New York trying to move money out of the country. I can tell you about different cities and states. I can tell you about different countries. I can tell you about all sorts of people that this has happened to. So for it to happen to me too, it happens to everybody. And we will further on go into what it is that we exactly need to do to be able to recover from this stuff and who we need to talk to and the things that we need to say. If at all possible, try to use something that obfuscates. Um, Apple Pay, they obfuscate. Anybody here set up Apple Pay yet? No? When you try to set up Apple Pay, you have to link it to like a credit card or a debit card. And when you do so, it will often tell you, I'm sorry, you can't link this card until you contact us and speak to us. Uh, so you have to call, make some phone calls, and you have to essentially um, initialize a path for them to be able to set this all up. And then upon doing so, what Apple Pay does is they obfuscate your information whenever you make a purchase, which is why many locations do not like this because it's very difficult to track you. It is not of benefit to them for you to use Apple Pay or for you to use any of these obfuscation tools because that method of tracking your purchases and all that social media data that they take whenever you are making purchases, all of that stuff is worth money to a company. They can use that uh, for data mining and things like that. Uh, if you're using a tool like this, it's much more difficult to do something like that. And of course, I, I leave up there many, many different choices. And with the PayPal thing, the moment I started getting emails, I picked up the phone, canceled the card, and began the process of saying, hey, these are not my charges. And tomorrow, whenever I come into work, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to file a police report and luckily, I don't have to go very far to go do that. <laughs> but uh, it's exactly what I'm going to have to do. And it's all part of the holidays. So we want to reduce our footprint. As few cards as possible. We want to reduce cash. We want to do all of these things. And then in addition to that, we want to make sure that whatever it is that we are using gives us as much control as we possibly can get over our finances. People out there are going to do the wrong thing, okay? I've talked about databases in here, and I've talked about different ways that people have messed up their security. Uh, one of the number one things that we teach people is not to use the username of admin and the password of admin. And then we sit down in this class, and we talk about businesses that are doing exactly that and have been found out as, oh, we leaked all of this information, and our database had a username of admin and a password of admin. So it occurs. So we're talking about no cash. We're talking about watching our credit cards. We're talking about making sure that whenever you sit down with those credit cards, keep track of what it is that you keep in your wallet. If you're going to carry a purse, which I don't recommend during the holidays, uh, make sure that you know what's in it. One of the, the, the toughest parts 
of having something happen to you is not knowing what to do whenever you do become a victim. So you want to make sure that you know what credit card you were carrying with you. You need to know what accounts are at risk. And in general, as it stands right now, if you have a credit card or you have an account, you should essentially consider it at risk just on account of the fact that there is potential methods for them to gain access to that information even before it ever gets to you. They can order a, uh, they can order a replacement card and then they can intercept it in the mail. And then once they've intercepted it in the mail, they set it up and then they have access to that replacement card and they're already making purchases before you ever even knew that the card was in their hands. Uh, an event that occurred to us, got a credit card that came in the mail, decided to go out to eat at a restaurant, handed the credit card at the end of the, the night to the waitress. The waitress took the card into the back, wrote down all the information on the card, scanned it, charged us, and then gave all of that information to an individual who then went across the street to uh, another restaurant and bought food and then bought gas and did all of these things while we were on the drive going home. And that was a brand new card. Just came in the mail, fresh card, had never been used anywhere. It was a brand new number and we use it one time at a restaurant and they immediately use it for fraud. So it happens. Let's start with watching your bags. Again, this is why I say let's not carry purses. Let's not carry bags. Let's try to keep this stuff from being something that somebody can grab. Thieves are going to look for distracted shoppers. When you're out there, you're going to have screaming children. You're going to have busy aisles. You're going to have lots and lots of potential victims mulling about. And they're going to be looking for opportunities to do purse, purse snatching, wallet theft, all of these things very very popular during the holiday and if you're following along I have plenty of links that go along with this uh, our first one we have a uh, 75 year old victim in a Walmart parking lot you know she's trying to take her cart back man comes up uh, takes the purse right off of her shoulder while she's walking in the parking lot and rides off on a skateboard Our next one is a target of opportunity. This is an individual who, distracted, uh, wasn't able to pay attention to what they were doing, decided to set down their wallet, and this person comes up, picks up the wallet while they're not looking, walks away with it, but they get caught on camera. Uh, the news that night puts this person's picture all over the place, and they actually brought the wallet back, and uh, return the wallet, just on account of the fact that their picture was all over the place. Uh, here's another elderly woman who was victimized. And this was a pair. Two individuals followed this lady out. Uh, she had her shopping cart with the purse inside of the shopping cart. And they approach, grab the purse, exit with the purse. Okay. Here's another one. 60 year old victim. Uh, again. I think Walmart is the. Is there a pattern here? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Seems, Seems like, like it, doesn't it? <clears throat> Seems that way. Uh, this lady, she attempted to chase her subject. I don't recommend that. And we're going to get into why I don't recommend that here shortly. But uh, she attempted to catch this person. This person got in a vehicle and fled in the vehicle. Okay. Again, one more. Elderly woman injured after purse stolen. Uh, this one tried to grab the purse. The lady tried to hold on to it. Yanked it away from her. Damaged her arm. Uh, that individual ran away. So I ask, do you see a pattern here? They're looking for individuals who can't really defend themselves, are not exactly paying attention, place the purse in the cart, maybe distracted trying to get into the vehicle or something similar. And in addition to that, they're all shopping. 
They're all out where they have money. They've got their credit cards with them. They have cash. They have whatever else it is that they're keeping in their purse for that trip. Cell phones, so on and so forth. All goods that somebody may want access to. Again, that's why I say try not to carry a purse if at all possible. Um, when my mother asked me, hey, I'm going to go out shopping. What do I take with me? I always tell her, remember, don't take your purse. Make sure that you leave the purse at home just on account of the fact that the individuals that are out there, they're going to be looking for that purse. Same with your car. Insurance doesn't cover everything, okay? And I have a pretty good article here that you can get to. And again, this is all through archive, so this stuff should last for a very, very long time. But it breaks it down for you that you can place all these packages in your vehicle. And a lot of people think, well, I have car insurance. And car insurance should cover that. Well, it doesn't. Oftentimes, they're going to tell you that you have to use your home insurance. And then even then, it's only going to cover X amount of money between you know, $500 to $1,500. And then in addition to that, you're most likely going to have a deductible. And then potentially you're going to increase your rates. So by the time it's all said and done, when you actually compare, well, is it worth it to report this and file an insurance claim? Or is it not worth it to file the insurance claim? Potentially financially wise, uh, you could end up in a situation where it's just not financially feasible to file the insurance claim. Um, and then some credit cards, though, are going to have protection benefits um, that will protect you, you know, within 90 to 120 days if something occurs with the product that you just bought with that credit card or if it's stolen or things like that. Uh, some of them do provide loss protection. Now, you need to make sure that you talk to your credit card company about this and find out what you qualify for and what's on the account and what you can actually expect in the event that you need to file something like this. Uh, in addition to that, I've noticed, so everybody here fully aware about what happened with Equifax, the Equifax breach and they dropped all this information and all this occurrence happened. Uh, I immediately started calling and contacting different companies, credit card company, bank account, uh, just so on and so forth. Anybody that I was particularly concerned about investments, things like that. I went to all of those individuals to ask, what are you going to do about it? What are you doing to protect my information? And what do I need to be worried about? And of course, if anybody else here has made those phone calls, the first thing that they tell you is, everything's 100% covered. Don't worry about it. We're going to watch over everything. No big deal. Uh, I know my credit card company said that. My bank said that. All of these individuals said that. And I told them, so what do I do in the event something does happen? And they were like, don't worry about it. What that tells me is, is that they don't actually have a plan. That's the, that's the real concern for me. Um, yes, they're telling me not to worry about it, but it just means they don't know what to do. And they, they're, they're preparing for it. Keep your receipts. Don't leave the receipts in the bag. If they steal the bag with the goods in it and you don't have the receipt, you're going to have a real hard time proving that you purchased that item, right? So separate things out. Uh, of course, the number one item being don't pack all that stuff into your car and leave it somewhere unsecured. But in addition to that, make sure that you have the receipts in a position where you have access to those separate from the goods. Because when you file your police report or when you contact the police department, they're going to ask you for receipts, for documentation, for all the information that they need to be able to successfully file that report. And don't forget, certain items are simply going to be excluded. This one, leak, uh, this one lists antiques, but there are certain other items that they simply won't cover. Uh, just like on your insurance policy, oftentimes firearms are separate from everything else. Jewelry is separate from everything else. There's going to be specific items that you may have purchased that that protection is not going to count for simply because of the nature of that item. So let's get into the mental security. And this is where it goes back to 
just a little while ago, I said I don't recommend chasing somebody down, following somebody, trying to, to, to instigate something. And this is where we discuss why. Our first one is a Good Samaritan. Uh, this individual out on Black Friday, out with their uh, family, witnesses a man uh, attacking a woman, intervenes, pulls the guy off of her, tells him to go. Guy turns around and puts a bullet through his neck. Kills him in the, the parking lot of Walmart. Okay? Uh, and this was out in San Antonio. So this gentleman lost his life because he tried to help a woman out in the parking lot of a San Antonio Walmart. Um, in addition to that, uh, several other individuals were also hit uh, by shrapnel, broken glass, things like that. There were other injuries as this guy fired multiple rounds. And I'm going to tell you right now, sometimes when I'm driving, I look at other people and I get mad. And I think, these people are doing something stupid. But I remember incidents like this. Shopper opens fire, killing one over what? Parking space. Where? Walmart. Somebody was trying to park their car to Walmart. Somebody else took the parking space. Uh, individual initiates a life-altering event right then and there, kills this person over a parking space uh, while out shopping. Did they catch the guy? Uh, yes. However, somebody still died. So, um, no offense, but I would rather be alive than grateful for them to have caught somebody. Uh, and this was during Black Friday. Okay, and, all, and pretty much all of these are going to be right around holiday. Okay, I try to make sure that all of this stuff is during that time. Again, Black Friday, this one's going to be at a mall, and this is in New Jersey, and uh, this was at a Macy's. Now, there's not a lot of information here, but what it sounds like is sometime after hours, there was some kind of confrontation out in the parking lot, and again, somebody opened fire and killed somebody. And uh, now this one is one that a lot of people don't think about. But what are we doing during the holidays? We're busy. We're running around. We're trying to wrangle kids. We're trying to wrangle family members. We're putting in maximum effort over several very condensed days. And people are not sleeping. They're drinking. Uh, they're trying to juggle partying with being able to make sure that everybody's still okay. Uh, this gentleman right here, he was driving home, went to a uh, Black Friday all night shopping event with his wife and his children, uh, hadn't slept in, uh, he hadn't slept more than three hours in a 24 hour period. He got three hours of sleep, was in the vehicle with the family, Wrecked his vehicle, the vehicle rolled over, and he killed several members of his family because he wasn't paying attention, he wasn't getting enough sleep, he was, he was running on empty during the holiday season. Now, we have drunk, drunk drivers, we have people who are out distracted. Uh, just a couple of, I would say about a month and a half ago, I was the passenger in a vehicle that was rear-ended by a young lady who decided she needed to be on Facebook while she was driving. Okay, so uh, people are not paying attention. They're on their phones. They're using electronic devices while they're behind the wheel. They're not sleeping. They're recovering from a you know two-day party binge, whatever it is that they're doing. They're not putting 100% attention in what they are doing. Here's another one. And now this one is sort of, um, this one's from 2011. And 
I kind of hesitated to put this one in here, but I went ahead and did it anyways because there is a, there seems to be two separate groups of people who were witness to this, with some people saying that after this man collapsed, other shoppers just stepped over the body. They were so busy trying to get into the store that once he hit the ground, they just pushed themselves over the body to get in to continue shopping and left him there. Um, and this was at a Target, and this gentleman was a Black Friday shopper who uh, had a uh, heart-related emergency, collapsed, and some people are saying that people stopped, and other people are saying that they witnessed people not stopping. Now, that's kind of a big, there's a, a, a big difference in there between stopping and not stopping, but uh, I thought I'd put that in there. So what's the point of all this? What am I really trying to drive home? We gotta be real careful with our emotions. When we're out there, we're gonna get mad. We're gonna have all this different stuff that's happening all around us. It's gonna upset us, and guess what? Other people are gonna be upset too. And there's absolutely nothing going on during Black Friday that's worth a gunfight out in the parking lot of the Walmart, okay? And even worse, here in a moment, we're going to start talking about some of the stuff that they're selling during Black Friday and how they get the prices to be cheaper and what's really going on whenever they're finagling some of this stuff. That, in all honesty, a lot of this stuff, not worth it. Watch out for your temper. Watch out for other people's tempers. And make sure that whatever it is that you decide that you're going to be doing during the holiday, try to get enough rest, pay attention to what's going on, make sure that you take a little bit time for yourself, okay? So what about shopping smart? What are people really running out there and doing? Why are they going out into this stuff? So again, I have another link here. And this one is called, uh, oh, there we go. Is Black Friday a scam? A lot of people are going to dress for what amounts to a very stressful period, go out on Friday and start looking for quote unquote deals. I like their example here with the flat screen TVs and this one's pretty good. So what a lot of these companies will do is it will say XTV inside of the ad and then it will say or equivalent in very, very small letters down at the bottom. Or it will say X manufacturer, and then it will have a serial number for said TV or device. And that serial number will be just a little bit different than a normal copy of that device. So if it's a 55 inch TV, 4K, so on and so forth, well, they're going to sell you a 55 inch TV that is 4K, but the serial number is going to be just a little bit tweaked. And it's going to be a model of that television that's only sold at that location, uh, like a Best Buy or uh, some other place, okay? And what they often do is they will reduce the quality of the materials used. They will use a manufacturing point that is of reduced quality. Um, they will do everything that they need to do to reduce whatever it is that they're putting into that product and then sell it to you for a cheaper price. And uh, not all of them, not all the items that they're gonna be selling are derivatives. Uh, sometimes what they'll do is they'll raise the prices throughout the first couple of months just before the holidays and you won't notice it. And then eventually, once the holidays roll around, they'll drop the price down to exactly the same price. Uh, in addition to that, now I don't have a link to this, but another thing that you can do is if you look up price guides for your favorite retailer, they will often tell you uh, online what the actual price means for that product. So if it ends with a five or a nine, that means that the price is reduced. If it ends with a zero, that means that that's the highest price that they, can, that they normally set it at. There's codes that are actually baked in to the price of the items themselves. 
and if you know those codes that are used for that specific store, then you can figure out whether or not the item is at a good sale price or not, just off of based off of how low that it's going to go at that company. Yeah. Is what you're describing, is it illegal to do all that stuff? No. Uh, no, it's, it's essentially their serial code for the item, and then they just use that to keep track of it. Companies like Walmart do it, Target does it, uh, what's another one, uh, American Eagle. So they're just making you think that you saved 150 bucks when in fact you didn't. Correct. For some of that stuff, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, if they, they did it months ahead of time, and uh, good example, and for those of you who are computer programmers in here, uh, a, most of the API stuff has been shut off on Amazon, but you can write some Python scripts, and this is kind of going to get nerdy here for a second, but bear with me for some of you. There's a way to write some Python scripts that will allow you, allow you to actually sit there and track the price of goods, and some people will charge money for that information. Like, you can gain access to it if you're not a software developer, and you can see the prices, and you can actually follow exactly when they raise the price and when they drop it, and it gives you a better idea of when you're going to want to make your purchase. Uh, in addition to that, there's a, um, for those of you who use eBay, there's a thing called an eBay sniper. And that's a tool that you can uh, download. And what, what it amounts to is, is you sit down and you say, okay, I want to I wanna bid on this item on eBay. And I'm going to set a maximum price for what I'm willing to bid. And then within the last two to three seconds, of the actual bidding occurring, the sniper fires and it will put in your bid right there at the last minute so that you don't actually have to like compete with other people. So there's <laughs> there's a whole bunch of tools that are out there available for individuals who are quote unquote in the know to gain access to, to greater savings that are available that way than the savings that are available through waiting for a specific day at the at a, a you know end of the month so what i'm really trying to tell you all is that your holiday shopping is not necessarily the best time to find deals and you got to be real careful with this stuff um, again intelligence analysis is what i do i i've worked in that for 5 years before i worked on that here and I like numbers and I sit down and I analyze things and I build spreadsheets and I do all of that stuff and you don't have to go to that extreme but um, depending on what it is that you're trying to buy or what you're looking at sometimes it may be better to shop at a different time of the year than right now this may not be the perfect time for what it is that you're looking for of course what are we really doing uh, a lot of this stuff is gonna be vanity stuff right I know that when I was in the guard, I threw on the parka and stood outside in front of the, the PX and it was trying to get a laptop. There was a very inexpensive laptop that somebody in my family needed and I sat out there and did everything that I had to do until I got that laptop. And what happened to the laptop? It got used for like, I don't know, a month. So. What happened after a month, bro? No, got bored. <laughs> the person got bored, didn't want it anymore. So um, it's not always, not always the best time to go shopping, right? However, uh, if that's not enough to get you thinking about alternatives, let's talk about Amazon for a second. Does, is anybody here not familiar with Smile? Okay, great. So what Smile is? Let me... Uh, What Amazon Smile is, is it's a method for you to go to Amazon, and once you've signed in and you go to smile.amazon.com, you can pick a charity. And as you make purchases on Amazon, they donate money to your charity of choice. Okay? Um, and the reason why I put that in here is because that's just one more reason to shop online when you have all this stuff that's going on out there, you have all these issues, there's 
all these things occurring, and I'm sitting here at my computer, and I'm looking at this stuff, and I think to myself, all right, do I want to go out and fight the crowd and be concerned about all these things, or do I want to shop online? Well, uh, I can go on eBay, and when you make an eBay purchase, they allow you to choose charities uh, that they will donate to. When you go on Amazon, they do the exact same thing, and many of your other companies, when, depending on who you're shopping with, will also provide methods for you to be able to donate to different charities. Uh, I personally, I chose Special Olympics of Arizona. That's a very popular with law enforcement. Uh, Special Olympics uh, being a charity that's sort of uh, well known within the law enforcement community. We have law enforcement torch runs and many individuals in law enforcement go out and help those athletes uh, with their competitions and with all their different stuff. So I can make my purchases and in addition to that I'm giving money to a charity that I believe in. So it might pay to shop from home instead of going out into the world to do this stuff. But now we need to move into digital security. So if we're going to be making those purchases online and looking at Cyber Monday and doing all of these things, then what do we do whenever we're going to put our information out there? So PayPal is supposed to offer robust purchase protection for their customers. Uh, if you head on over to their site, which I linked to, uh, they're supposed to give you all sorts of security. Uh, in addition to that, if you go and you look at like your credit card company of choice, whether it be Discover, American Express, so on and so forth, they're also going to have very similar terms of service in which they promise you things like 24-7 monitoring, that they're using secure technology like encryption. Uh, they're going to offer dispute resolution and all of this other stuff. And they even say that they have fraud prevention. Well, I can tell you right now they didn't prevent it. Okay, uh, that didn't happen. But these are the things that they promise. Um, I know with my bank, they have told me that I have a zero liability with the bank. If something were to happen, they would make sure that I would get my money back. Uh, same with pretty much all of my credit card companies. Now, when you actually put this to the test, that's when things get tough. Um, I recommend using these tools, but you're going to be looking at situations, especially over a specific dollar amount, which I can't tell you what those dollar amounts are, but they have sort of cutoffs where they won't be as supportive. Um, and we'll go into how to file a police report and sort of what you can do with it as we get further along, but I want to start there. Now, some people are going to get told, and you're going to see this out when you're shopping, there are things like Bitcoin and other alternative currencies. So I'm going to give you a warning right here, and we got it on film. I'm not an investment banker, I'm not a professional investor, and I'm not licensed to give financial advice. I'm just here to kind of inform you about Bitcoin, okay, and some of these alternative currencies. The number one thing that I tell people to look at first is tulip mania. Okay, and I have a link here that if you're following along on the site and you decide that you want to look at this stuff, I do have a link uh, to a Wikipedia article about uh, what happened in uh, the, I believe at the time they were still called, um, you know what, I think they were called the Dutch Republic. Essentially what happened was the Dutch got to a point where they had enough money that they could start buying things, sort of on the, the global market of the 1600s, okay? Uh, and once they reached this point of having enough money, what they started doing was trading in flowers, tulips. And it got to the point where if you could make 30 of their uh, uh, guilders, their, their, what amounts to their version of the dollar, right? If you could make 30 of those in a year, they were flowers that they were selling for 3000 okay? Just to kind of give you a, an idea of how much these flowers were worth. And then one day overnight, all of that stuff just fell out. And it wasn't worth anything anymore. I really recommend that people read that and get familiar with that. And then once you're familiar with that, look at things like price bubbles. 
and start understanding future markets. Those are your, those are your items that you need to look into. So future markets? Future markets. Okay? If you want to learn about Bitcoin, start there and get a good understanding of those items and then start looking at the companies that are actually investing in and investigating blockchain technology. I'm just going to give you a list of three here. Australian Securities Exchange, Wells Fargo, and IBM. All fairly well-known names, okay? All places that wouldn't, you wouldn't have any problem being able to look these places up, or if you were to talk to somebody, they would know who these folks are. But they're in investing and investigating the exact same technology that's being put into Bitcoin. Now, I'm not going to tell you Bitcoin's good, and I'm not going to tell you Bitcoin's bad. That's up to you to make those decisions. Same with all the other alternative currencies like Ethereum and uh, Dogcoin and all the other stuff that they brought out. Um, and for those of you who are looking for more information on this stuff, I do provide a link to Coindesk. And you can come here and you can start reading about all these different companies, including the NASDAQ, the London Stock Exchange, New York Stock Exchange, so on and so forth, who are all putting varying amounts of time, money, and investment into researching these technologies. Okay? But we also need to understand that this stuff fluctuates. It's relatively new technology. It hasn't been around for a long time. Okay? Um, Bitcoin itself has a history of fluctuating up and down 40% or more in what amounts to breakneck speed. So your investment for one minute can be worth $5,000 in the morning, and by that afternoon it can be worth $1,000, and then it can go right back up. An example of this is Ethereum. Uh, Ethereum crashed down to $0.10 cents from $319. Ethereum being another alternative currency very similar to Bitcoin. So one day, a single Ethereum is worth $319. The very next second, it's worth $0.10. Cents. Uh, what ended up happening was somebody took a multi-million dollar sell order and fulfilled it. And as soon as they fulfilled that sell order, the price just crashed. Um, but after a few days, the market readjusted and everything went back up to $325. So... If you're looking for stability, it's not there. And of course, like our Bitcoin fluctuations, I have a link. Uh, you can follow it. it. talks about some of the bubbles, what they're learning. Uh, one of the problems with archive.is is it doesn't archive all of the JavaScript. And so because of that, some of the pages are a little messed up. But you can definitely follow along it goes over to what's happening in China what's happening all over the world in relations to alternative currencies uh, again another link that goes over what's going on with Ethereum and their crash so I have news articles for everything that I discuss here so that you can follow along and then let's get into the big one because this just happened and now I'm kind of picking on Ethereum because this just happened on November 8th. But uh, their Parity wallet, which is a multi-sig wallet, had a vulnerability in it. A really big one. And so what did that vulnerability do? Well, essentially, a user who decided to get on GitHub, and GitHub is for computer programmers to go on there and share code. I have a GitHub account. A lot of the other people that I'm familiar with in this class, they all have GitHub accounts. Uh, it's a good place to be able to go on there, share code, uh, collaborate, and work on different projects. Well, this individual gets on there and starts looking at the parity code. And they claim, this person does claim, to not be a computer programmer, to have no idea what they're doing, and to be playing around. And while playing around, they sent a cancel request across all of the wallets, which, in theory, that cancel request should have done nothing. But instead, what it did was is essentially shut all of the wallets down and lock them. He canceled everybody's wallet. So what happened? Well, within moments, uh, they lost $280 million. Just poof. Just as if somebody went out and said, all this money right here, it's, it's no good anymore. That's what this person did. Just waved a hand and $280 million was gone. And that's just initial estimates. 
they're not actually sure how much money was actually lost yet. Okay? And from what I've read so far, that stuff is gone. Uh, they have not recovered any of it. Now, that's not their first rodeo. Previously, they uh, accidentally baked in some uh, vulnerabilities where they lost $30 million in funds that were stolen. So you got $30 million in stolen funds and $280 million in what amounts to uh, canceled funds. And we're starting to see some pretty major losses here. Pretty big. Okay? Uh, and if you're interested in all of this stuff, again, we have news accounts that go to it. So if you'd like to go to the CoinDesk webpage, you can read about some of the thefts that have happened. Um, for those of you who are interested in uh, alternative currencies already, there's companies like Mt. Gox and others that have sort of come and gone, failed over the years. Um, Mt. Gox's big thing was they claimed that somebody was able to gain illicit access to their wallets and steal the money. And then once the money was gone, they had no way to recover and they couldn't pay out anymore. But uh, I guess the guy panicked and for a little while he tried to turn it into a Ponzi scheme. He was still accepting money while not allowing people to pull money out. And then he tried to feed money out slowly from the money that was coming in. That failed and the whole thing collapsed around his ears. And the guy ended up getting arrested out in Japan. So that's a lot of problems, right? There's a lot of issues here with all of this stuff that's going on. And um, it's kind of wild west. In addition to that, because a lot of this stuff hasn't had like rulings and there isn't a lot of agreement on what is and is not legal, uh, some of the behaviors that in normal financial institutions would be considered illegal and punishable, right now some of that stuff is not being punished yet. Uh, they're able to take behaviors that you would do that are considered criminal in regular financial institutions and then emulate that stuff in Bitcoin and they're getting away with a lot of money. Um, part of the problem with uh, things like Bitcoin are there's a lot of currency manipulation in which they'll force the price down, buy up more, price goes back up, they sell, and there, there's a lot of movement in that that's coming from some pretty big spenders. And you can follow it all along in the blockchain. You Google about it and they'll actually show you where you can read about that stuff. So now let's talk about our accounts because this is going to be pretty important as well. And this is a big deal and I'm going to focus on this even though there's not a lot of, whole lot of text here. This is actually pretty important. And uh, again, Links to back it up, so if you want to follow along or read along, um, and that's Marissa right there. She uh, she runs Yahoo or used to. They had Equifax come in, and we're all familiar with the Equifax breach, and then they had Yahoo come in uh, to speak to the Senate. They had a Senate hearing, and they asked these individuals to come on in and uh, give an explanation for what happened. Tell us a little bit about your cybersecurity. Tell us a little bit about the events that led up to the attacks. Tell us what was lost. Tell us about what you did to fix it. And what are your plans for recovery? Those sound like pretty fair questions to me. Um, they didn't know at all. Couldn't tell you how they got in. Couldn't tell you who took what. Couldn't tell you what was missing. Couldn't tell you why. Couldn't tell you when. Uh, didn't really have any information at all. What it amounted to was we don't know. We don't know anything about these accounts. We don't know where it went, why, when, nothing. Uh, if you've been following along with the Equifax stuff, let me give you kind of a breakdown of what we know cybersecurity-wise happened. Uh, somebody set up some databases, and those databases essentially had a username of admin and a password of admin. So that was the extent of their cybersecurity. And after setting up those, those accounts, um, they also were told that there were some vulnerabilities in their server in what's called Apache Struts. And it's sort of a web development framework. Okay, we'll just call it that. And so they get told, hey, you need to make these updates. If you don't make these updates, then your system is going to be vulnerable to attack. 
uh, you have six months to do it. So six months coming on, and they said, okay, it's cool. We're not worried about it. And uh, now the claim was made that they gave it to their security guy. Not guys, not team, not unit, one dude. One dude who was in charge of all of the cybersecurity for Equifax. And that person was told to make a server update. And they tried to say, well, that one person didn't do it. Um, a lot of us in here have either been in the military or other paramilitary organizations. Um, let's talk about helicopters for a second. You don't have one person that just goes out and looks at the helicopter and says, yeah, that's cool. Go ahead. Hop in that thing. I don't care. It doesn't work like that. Uh, jets. They don't have one person that goes out and looks at a jet and goes, yep, that's fine. Uh, here in the law enforcement community, you have more than one person who goes out and inspects the vehicles and makes sure they're safe and checks tires and looks at the safety of the vehicle before it is out on the road. There is more than one person who puts eyes on tons and tons of stuff out in the community. And that's probably like that at just about everybody's job here and anybody else's job anywhere else. But what they're saying is, is that they had hired a single person to manage all of the databases and all of the cybersecurity for Equifax across the entire globe. I have a hard time believing that that's the case and that potentially this was just something that was said, and this is personal opinion, but it was something that was said in an attempt to deflect what was going on. Because for you to tell me that you only had one person running this stuff, that's super hard to believe. But if it's true, that's even worse. Um, another reason why they brought in that, that Marissa Mayer is that after all of those accounts, uh, were lost. They then sold the entire company to Verizon, and she got to walk away with $260 million. Okay? So she loses all the accounts, and essentially the entire business model consists of having accounts and keeping those accounts safe. One guy walked away with $216 million? Not one guy, this, this lady right here. She walked away with $260 million. One person. One person. Holy moly. Talk about a golden parachute. And they weren't able to tell anybody how any of this stuff happened. How did your accounts get stolen? I don't know. When? I don't know. Uh, in addition to that, she couldn't explain why it took three years for them to be able to even tell people about the breach. So they've had multiple breaches on top of breaches. And this is another thing that I think possibly they're getting confused here, is that they had data information leaks and then another data information leaks. And one of the problems with having an incorrectly configured server is that anybody who cruises by can very quickly find out that this thing is configured incorrectly and start pulling information from it. In addition to that, in my introduction to dark market class, uh, when we talk about this stuff where they go to sell this data, it's very easy for these guys to look at some of the data and start to get a kind of an idea of where that data comes from. And it gives them ideas of where to go sniffing to gain access to that data themselves. Um, in addition to that, they even have no-go networks where they, they list a list of IP addresses where people have registered themselves as, don't hack me. This is my, this is my address. It's kind of like, um, let me give you an example here. It's kind of like going to the newspaper and putting your home address and saying, don't come here and break into my house because this is my home address and I put it in the newspaper and don't, you're not allowed to come here. And that's, that's essentially their cybersecurity consisted of telling people not to go there and don't hack them. Okay? Um, One of the nice things that she did was she did apologize. And she was very, very sorry that all those accounts were lost. What did she do with the money? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm sorry, I didn't take more. 
and then at our at our friends at Equifax, uh, a lot of them left. And then this is also interesting, and I'm not sure how this is going to play out because of the fact that um, it's sort of still being investigated. But just before they decided to announce what happened at Equifax, a whole bunch of them took all of their stocks and their options and all the other stuff and went and sold it. But then what they did was they had an internal investigation where they found that nobody did any wrongdoing. So they investigated themselves and then cleared themselves of all wrongdoing and then came back and said that everything was cool with what they did. Um, so that's interesting. Uh, so after they sold millions of dollars worth of stock, then they went out and they informed the public about what happened and then the stock wasn't worth as much anymore. Uh, and then, uh, of course, they talked about some of the, the, the problems with the breach and what happened. And of course, it comes out that, well, none of this stuff was a sophisticated attack. And if you look at any of my other classes, you'll find out that really what it comes down to is going around and knocking on doors. They, they have a tool. Uh, one of the tools we discuss is called Mass Scan. And lo and behold, what do you think Mass Scan does? It scans the internet. And it just goes from server to server to server, and it looks for ports, and it looks for um, whatever tools that are being used to communicate, and it just knocks. And it says, hey, is this open? No? OK. What about this? Is this open? And it just checks. And it's all automated, and you can just let it sit there, and you can let it run. And if you have a, a nice enough setup with a fast enough internet connection, you can scan the entire internet in about five to eight minutes. So every single server on the internet that's connected right now, within eight minutes, you can go and you can knock on every single door to see whose door is open. None of this stuff takes very long to manipulate or to get into. None of it. And it's not even like the digital equivalent of smash and grab because they're not paying attention to any of this stuff anyways. It's the digital equivalent of going in and setting up shop and living in somebody else's house for three months before they notice that you're there. That's what they're doing. Uh, also, Equifax did make the announcement that they plan to spend four times as much on cybersecurity. So they're going to spend more money. Four times zero. <laughs> four times zero, that's right. <laughs> that's four employees. <laughs> yeah, right. Four yeah. guys that did not. So I have some information up here about social security numbers. In one of my last talks, I actually had a, a gentleman who decided to, to ask some questions about something that I said. And I brought up the fact that our social security numbers for a long period of time were um, generated off of what amounts to a formula. So if you knew where a person was born and in what year they were born, you could potentially use that formula to get a list of all of the social security numbers that would have been issued during that time period and then potentially that person's social would be in that list if they got their social issued in the same area that they were born. And of course, if they moved and got their social issued from somewhere else, it would not be the same formula. Um, I went ahead and went to the actual Social Security Administration. And right here is a link to be able to verify Social Security numbers so they can actually go in and tell you whether or not it is a legitimate number. They can't tell you whether or not that number is actually issued to that person, but what they can tell you is whether or not that, that social number would be considered the actual social, like an actual social. And then in addition to that, they also provide a lot of information on the, how the social is built. Now, good news for all of us is um, that's not going to be the current policy very soon. They're going to end that policy of generating social security numbers from what amounts to a formula that anybody else can sit there and um, do the same thing. They're going to now make social security numbers in a randomized method. Now the problem I have with that is people are still going to ask you for your social. And your social is still going to be in databases. And it's still going to go places. People are going to still have access to all of this stuff. So even though the social has been randomized, I'm not exactly sure what kind of good that's going to do when the social security number is going to still be out in the world available to people. Now, on a personal note, 
my biggest concern right now about Equifax and their loss of our social security numbers, all of the jobs that we've ever worked at, how much money we make, all of our addresses, everywhere that we've lived, uh, our names, uh, what else was in there? I believe our vehicles that we own were also in there and essentially everything that your employer reports, which for some employers that can vary. So all of that stuff that is now out in the world, uh, one of my big concerns is tax time. So tax time is going to hit and people are going to use this information to go out and they're going to file your taxes. And they're going to file those taxes in a way that they get a great big old return. And now you're going to be tied up with the IRS dealing with trying to get your tax stuff. You're saying some other strangers are going out there to file taxes for other people? and That's already been happening, yes. And getting the return? Correct. And they do get the return. And that's not illegal? No, that is illegal. No, that's very illegal. <laughs> that, that is a huge problem right now. Um, does anybody remember when uh, the IRS turned off the ability to file the taxes online for, for a short while? They had that system where you could go in and then it turned out that you could just randomly put numbers and information into it and it was sort of essentially allowing you to just connect with somebody's account. And people were funneling information into the system programmatically and just filing tax returns and getting millions of dollars out of the government. That's incredible. And so that has already happened and that's already an issue like a, a blemish slash black eye on the government and then now we have the Equifax breach and so my big concern is what are you going to do with that information? Well the number one thing that you should do with it is you're going to go and you're going to go file tax returns and you're going to pull money from the government and leave somebody else to have to go deal with the IRS. So the, the, the safety is to not have any money, to make no money. <laughs> Well, what are they going to do? You know, I make, I make $15,000. Well, you don't need to file a tax return. Well, I can't get anything. Well, if they do file, though, you're still going to be on the hook for when they come looking for the, the return back. They're going to do an audit, and then eventually they're going to come calling at your door. Is anyone safe? So, I guess I should have. <laughs> I guess I should have prefaced this with, oftentimes, by the end of my class, a lot of people are very, very unhappy, and I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this this class is a huge downer, and I probably should have said that before <laughs> before we hit the first hour. Um, no, essentially nobody's safe, and there's a ton of stuff that's going on all over the world right now, and it's all terrible. But so my thing here is, I want to tell everybody in the world as much information as I possibly can about all the stuff that's happening. And I feel that the most important thing that I can possibly do with everything that I know and everything that I'm trained on is to get as much of that data out to the public in an easy way to digest so that people can understand what's going on. Um, I've spent a lot of my life dealing with a lot of stuff like this and it's not fun and um, it's happening and people need to know about it. Because if you don't know about it and you get blindsided by it, then it's much, much harder to recover from than if you know about this stuff and you kind of have an idea of what you can do to try to recover. Uh, you are one of my students. Most of my classes are like that. Yeah, so. I know, <laughs> just go home and cry after the class, yep. Um, so what scams and crimes are there? Let's talk about some of these scams, these crimes. What are they going to be doing with all this information? They're stealing, they're taking, they're doing all these things. What are they trying to do? Well, we're going to talk about skimming. We're going to talk about identity theft. We're going to talk about physical theft. Then we're going to talk about kidnapping, and we're going to talk about home invasions. Okay? All the stuff that we need to talk about so that you're aware of what's really happening. Now, this is a very interesting link right here. And this is a big deal, and it really tells you about some of the stuff that's going on around here. Since October 17th, on October 17th, they found 50 credit card skimmers across the valley. For those of you who don't know what a credit card skimmer is, what they do is they go out and they buy a device. And that device is very, very small, and oftentimes it will fit over the top of a credit card reader like at a gas station. 
and when you place your credit card inside of it and then pull it out, uh, it scans the card and then gives that information to somebody so that they can create a copy of your card and start using that card illicitly. Okay? Now, back in the day, you kind of had to come close to the device. It was done off of Bluetooth. Uh, they had to get in their car and drive to the device and sit in the parking lot and hit a few buttons on a computer and they would download that information. Nowadays, the, the devices are much more robust. Uh, they come with cell phone uh, cards that you can place inside of it, SIM cards. You can put a little SIM card inside of the device and then you can install the device and as soon as you use the card, it essentially dials home and says, hey, this is this person's credit card information. So that within seconds, your credit card is being printed at a, at a device, you know, 100 miles away and being used immediately, okay? Um, now, how did they combat this? Well, they started teaching and maybe a lot of you have heard this. Before you use the credit card machine, approach it and grab the, the area that you are going to place your credit card in and just sort of wiggle it. Give it a little wiggle and a shake and try to pull on it a little bit just to check. And that's sort of what they, they told people for a long time. It's not really helpful um, because what they're doing is, is they cut the security tape. Um, anybody ever look at the side of a gas station and it's got a little thing and it says, hey, if this has been cut, don't use this. Well, they cut it and they open it. And then once they open it, they install the device on the inside so you can't see it. And they set up the little antenna and they close it. And then you're not going to believe this. But they buy tape that says, if this is cut, don't, you know, don't use the thing, and then they retape the thing. And they put the tape right over it, because the tape costs, you know, 50 cents a roll on web pages, Amazon, whatever. And they just tape the device back up and then they send it on its way. And you wouldn't know. And the system's not sending out a Bluetooth signal, it's not sending out a Wi-Fi signal, nothing on the machine looks odd, and there's nothing for you to shake, wiggle, or, or move. And so the device is just within the machine and harvesting credit card information until enough people have used it and then they're able to pinpoint, okay, this device is being used at this Circle K. We need to go check all the boxes at Circle K. Do any of these people ever get caught? Yes. Actually, some of them do get caught, but then we can, if we have time, I'll talk a little bit about that just on account of the fact that what a lot of people don't understand is that oftentimes, bless you, some of the people that are being caught are honestly unaware of what they're doing. Uh, they're, they're called mules, very similar to like drug mules and things like that. And they convince them monetarily to take actions that may not overtly look illegal. And they'll do these things. And then they find out later that they were actually a party to a crime. And they're the ones that get caught because they're the ones here in the United States operating. So we talked about those. Um, they're used at gas stations, ATM kiosks. They're a way for you to steal information. Remember, this was one of our questions up here. So if you're taking notes and want to pass the test, here it is. Uh, in addition to that, some of these credit card kiosks and restaurants are becoming a response to these issues. Anybody go into um, um, Outback? You go into Outback and they got the little credit card machine like at your table now. They don't allow the waitress to take your credit card anymore. Um, that was, that's how I got popped. The waitress took the credit card to the back, made copies of it, and then took my information. Well, now they're moving the devices directly to the desk. Um, those are potentially vulnerable as well, though. So, you know, the devil you know and the devil you don't know, I guess. But um, those are there as well. Here's another list of identity theft issues that are going on during the holidays. Um, let's talk about emails and phone calls. The police are not going to call you and demand that you pay a ticket over the phone. Not going to happen. Never, never, ever, 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 million years, never, ever going to happen. Nobody from the police department or any police department is ever going to pick up the phone and say, if you don't give me $350 cash right now, we're coming to your house to, to hook you up. Not going to happen, okay? I want to make sure that every single person in this room, if you walk away with nothing else, walk away with the fact that they're not going to call up and try to extort you over the phone. That's not what the police do. 
okay? Um, one of the gentlemen that I was working with today, he gets a phone call, and it's a it's a older lady on the phone, and she says, "Did you all just call me asking for money?" No. No, we didn't. But uh, whenever you make a phone call, it is not outside the realm of possibility or difficult to spoof uh, the number that's being used. So I can make it look like I'm calling from anywhere. I can make it look like I'm calling from the White House. I can make it look like I'm calling from any place on the planet. I can dial a number, call that number, and make it look like I'm somebody else. So you can't trust your caller ID, and you can't trust what's on your phone. Just because it has Chandler Police Department across the top, that is not difficult to change at all. Okay? Um, so, obviously, not everybody knows that the police are not going to call you and try to extort cash from you. But now that everybody in this room now knows, uh, it's, a, it's a good thing to keep in mind. In addition to that, if you get an email, a phone call, if you get anything and it sounds too good to be true, one of the, the popular scams when I was growing up would be a van would pull up next to you in a parking lot and a bunch of guys would open the door on the van and they'd ask you if you want to buy some stereo equipment. And they'd be like, hey, come over here. We got stereo equipment, super cheap. It's a $10,000 subwoofer setup for your house for $25. We really got to get rid of it. But you know what? And we'll throw in something else, and now it's $500, and so on and so forth. And really what it is is a bunch of boxes full of rocks and maybe an empty speaker that they put on top so it looks like there's some speakers in there. Uh, if it's too good but to be true, it is. Like, it just it is. Just like if you get an email that says, this XYZ celebrity open this .exe file and you get to see this person nude, they've been doing it for a million years, People still fall for it. It's not real. Okay? It just, it's not. Shop carefully, obviously. Review your account statements. Hey, I have them sent straight to my phone. Within minutes of knowing that somebody was at Trujillo's Taco Shop, I had my card shut down. Okay? And for those of you who came in late at 522 today, just before, you know, a little while before this class started, somebody started using my credit card out in San Diego. So, happens to the best of us. Uh, watch for credit card skimmers. There's really not a lot you can watch for. I know it says watch for credit card skimmers. Mm. In addition to that, most of them are smart enough to know not to use the credit card that they skimmed within the first three months of them gaining access to the card, which is probably what happened to me. At some point, I used that card, and they just sat on it and sat on it and sat on it, and then eventually, now that it's the holidays, they used it right now in the hopes that I would be using the card and not paying attention to what's going on. They're trying to hide those purchases inside the noise of whatever it is that I'm doing right now. Uh, be careful with your retail card applications and stuff like that. And of course, they're going to mail credit cards to you. And guess what? People are going to steal your credit cards. Uh, mail fraud, real big right now. Stealing from the mail, real big. Um, uh, UPS package snatching. Yep, package snatching, all of that stuff. I, I kind of want to tell a story that I don't know if I can tell. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, so for a while, I had a, um, you know what, I'll just tell it. I owned a house in another city, and during that time while I was in the guard, uh, we all have them, but the, at the time, it was relatively new to me and my community that I was living in to have like a communal mailbox. Like that was super weird to us. When I grew up, we had a mailbox, and the guy in the shorts drove around in the little truck, and he jumped out, and he put mail in each box. And my mom would send me outside to get the mail. Well, I get my own house, and they gave us this communal mailbox. And of course, the people in the mail have no idea where to put the mail. And they're just putting stuff in boxes. They don't care. And my mail kept getting stolen, open, stolen, packages were being opened, all this stuff. And I got all the way to the point where I involved the postal inspector. And I was like, look, either you need to come out here and teach your people how to read the numbers on the box or something, but I'm tired of my mail being broken into. 
And uh, they weren't doing it, and they weren't doing it. So during that period of time, I was doing um, active shooter training, and then I went to some counterterrorism training, and I ordered some books on um, things like poisons and explosives and terrorism and all this stuff that I had to have for these courses that I was taking. And they were all big red books that looked super official and super scary. And when you open them, they had all kinds of crazy information in them, right? And they were all packed with, you know, U.S. government paperwork. So I have this stuff shipped to me. And I'm waiting for it, and I'm waiting for it, and I'm not getting it. And one day, I hear a knock on the door, and it's the police. And they come and knock, and they say, hey, we need to talk to you about your books. <laughs> because the person had broken into the mailbox, again, my mail, opened my box, found all this terrorism-related training material in this box, freaked out, threw the box, and called the police on me, and decided they were going to have law enforcement show up, uh, I guess, to be a hero now, you know, after they were getting ready to steal whatever electronics were in there, and it was just crummy books. Um, so I had to go out there, and I had to explain, you know, why I had these books and what I was doing. And the, the guy recognized me because I often worked with the police and as soon as he realized whose house it was he was laughing and I was laughing and we got my books and all that stuff and uh, I'll tell you what though um, after that they stopped stealing my mail so that was nice there was a benefit to that <laughs> no no not that I know of but they they stopped going through my mail <laughs> uh, and then of course we have stuff like monitor and freeze your credit or your accounts if hacked uh, that's what I did. Somebody broke into my thing. I immediately hit them with the, hey, this is fraud. Cancel the account. Lock my credit card. Uh, and I haven't gotten another email sent, so they're not using the card right now. So physical theft. And this is the big one, kidnapping and home invasion. And why do we have this up here? It's the holidays, right? This isn't, this isn't very holiday. This is actually from Florida, and this is fairly rec recent, and uh, funny enough, the UK news did a better job of reporting this than the US news. This is the UK news, and then this is the US news, and the US news isn't very well done, and they didn't re report on this very well. But uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what happened to this young lady and her family, and then I'm going to show you some pictures. And I think the pictures really kind of explain some of the stuff that occurred. So this young lady comes out of her house. Uh, her house has a very long tree-lined sort of driveway away from the home. And as she's going down, um, for anybody who's ever done counterterrorism work, uh, as she's coming around a blind corner, she comes upon a roadblock in the middle of the street on her street. Somebody had taken barrels and built a roadblock. Uh, thank God this young lady was uh, either trained or knowledgeable or something, but this 17-year-old girl decides to run the roadblock. Goes around or through it with her car, runs the roadblock, gets away. Her father hears the commotion outside and he grabs a firearm, heads outside, and as he heads outside, several other individuals uh, who are going to simultaneously strike the house. And these are all like 17-year-old kids, okay? 15 to 17-year-old kids. So they tried to block the road. They were going to do the carjacking, grab the young lady. They had tape and weapons and so on and so forth prepared for her. And then they had weapons prepared for the father. And they were going to hit both simultaneously as a group. Uh, he comes out of the home and returns fire on these kids, and they scatter. And uh, they run, grab a vehicle, they take off. Um, my understanding is he grabs a vehicle, takes off after him, and uh, they're now all being charged with attempted kidnapping and attempted home invasion robbery right now. Um, and of course, when the police stopped them, they found knives, guns, rolls of tape, so on and so forth, everything that you need for a successful kidnapping. Now, the most important picture, and this is the home, all the trees, you can see the, the area. No line of sight. This is a terrible defensive position right here. Plenty of places for somebody to hide all around the house, okay? In addition to that, all the photos that this young lady was putting on social media, like her very expensive watch, 
in her very expensive dress and play-by-play -play breakdowns of how much money her dad was spending on remodeling the home and their cars and all of these things that she shared on social media that then, what I'm assuming at her school, other people then viewed this stuff and made the assumption, well, it looks like these people have money and we want that money. And so they decided to attempt to execute a kidnapping slash home invasion slash whatever it was that they were going to do to the father and then try to grab whatever money and such that they could in the house. Um, and of course, plenty of pictures of their vehicles, their property, all their, their things that they have. And so what am I trying to get at here? What am I trying to tell everybody? Don't put everything on social media. Don't. And be careful, cautious, children, grandchildren, so on and so forth. What are they putting on social media? Uh, anybody who knows me in here or has taken classes with me, I don't have a personal social media account. I have a business one, but I don't have a personal one. Is there any way to get rid of a social media account? You like can, my Facebook, I don't want it anymore? You can go in there and you can deactivate it, but it's never gone permanently. You have to change the security settings so it doesn't show your stuff when it's deactivated. Correct. And you, yes, you do. You, you have to go in there and you have to change security settings and you have to say, hey, don't show it. And then you have to say, hey, deactivate this. But at the end of the day, they still essentially own all of that information and none of it ever gets deleted. So, so Facebook owns all that information. Correct. Your photos. Friend people from safety. Your, your photos, every piece of information that you've ever posted on there, all your, your discussion and talking points, everything that you've done on that social media, none of that ever goes away. And if you read the actual like agreements, all of that stuff is permanent. That's theirs. You've agreed to give that to them, and they own it, essentially. They have. Forever, yeah. Yes, absolutely. So, so don't is what I'm telling you. Be careful with what you put on there. Uh, talk to the kids. Talk to the grandparents. Make sure everybody knows, hey, let's not put this stuff on there. And there are examples. There are plenty of examples. Uh, especially at around this time of year, what are people doing? They're traveling, right? And so what do they do? They get on Facebook and they say, man, I sure do love it in Virginia right now. Whole family's here. And somebody looks at it and goes, hey, I bet that house is empty. And they drive by and they see the light turns on every day at 5 o'clock, right at 5 p.m., boom, all the lights are on. And they stay on for X number of hours and they switch off at the same time. And they go, yeah, that house is empty. It doesn't take a genius to take all of your social media information and everything that you're providing to the criminals and then just do a very cursory glance over on the home and then say, yep, this is a vulnerable place. You need to be careful with what you're doing on social media and what you're putting out there. Now, something that law enforcement can do to help you. You can actually file and ask for frequent patrol, and you can also file for what's known as uh, like a holiday check. And you can call in and say, hey, I need a holiday check on my home. I'm going to be out of town from X date to X date. And you can have the police make a grander presence in your area. They'll come cruise through. They'll check on the home. They'll actually walk around the home if you ask them to. Hey, I need an officer to come by and just make sure that nobody's busted out my windows. I'd really appreciate it. They will do stuff like that. Okay? The, the Chandler Police Department out here, I've worked with a lot of police departments from all over. They are fantastic people who do a lot of stuff for the community. And I know it sounds like, oh, well, he works for him. He would say that. I've worked for a lot of places. This is one of those places that I can say they actually do stuff for the community out here. Um, so social media, be careful. Don't be posting things online that you shouldn't be posting. Talk to the kids about it. Make sure they know too. And again, expensive jewelry, dresses, all your presents, all that stuff. None of that stuff really needs to be on social media. So now we're getting to, well, what if I am a victim? Hey, I was just a victim. 522, I was a victim. What am I going to do? You're going to need to file a police report. That's what I'm going to do. Uh, some of your crimes can actually be committed, or can, not committed, sorry. Don't, <laughs> don't do that. 
<laughs> some of these crimes can be reported online, but again, if the crime is in progress or um, if it happens somewhere where you're present, you're probably going to want to call the police. And if it's something that's like going on right then and there, dial 911. Um, if you live in Chandler or uh, something happens to you out here in Chandler, this is actually our web page. Uh, right down here, it says file a police report. I'm going to click on that. And then it gives you a breakdown. You can actually start your police report right on the Chandler Police Department web page. So you can sit down, and if you have all of your data, and you have all the information that you need, uh, it'll even tell you the things that we can and cannot take. There are certain things that you must speak to an officer for. Like you have to. We, we can't not take it online. But a lot of this stuff we can. Um, and it explains all of that. And then once you hit start your report, it even goes through and has some report qualifiers for you. You just come in here and say, hey, did it happen in the city limits of Chandler? Yes, it did. Hit yes. Or if the incident involves identity theft and you are a resident of Chandler, hit yes. Uh, do you have an email address? Spoiler alert, you have to have an email address. That one's a mandatory yes. If you don't have it, it's going to fail out and it won't let you continue. But so on and so forth. And it just goes through all of that, and you can progress through the entire report. And then at the end, you get your police report number, and you'll have numbers that you can use while you begin your, your claims process and so on and so forth. And then in addition to that, um, you'll have the number that you can contact an officer with, and they can look up your case. So online or calling. Uh, make sure, though, that you have all the information that you need. And let's talk about that. And we're going to talk about a concept called being a good witness. And if anybody's ever worked in security or in uh, gate guard duty or anything like that, you, you'll understand the concept of being a good witness. But we'll go over that. Document everything. Document it all. If you're a victim, even if it doesn't seem like maybe something that's super important and you're not sure, make sure that you document it. Just keep it. Um, hard drive space is cheap nowadays. We're not looking at $2,000 for 32 megabytes anymore. Document your stuff. Uh, take pictures. Scan the documents. Make yourself a very good record of everything that happened. Okay. You, the, the thing that you do not want is when they ask you a question, you don't want to have to say, I don't know. Do your best to be able to have an answer for whatever it is that you're dealing with. Um, we're going to be looking for who, what, when, where, why, and how. And as best you know, OK? We're not saying that you have to have everything, because obviously you're not going to have everything. But you're going to want as much as you can. So who? Well, I was the victim. The what? Someone used my credit card without my knowledge or permission. When? Well, the bill says that they ate at a restaurant on X date, and then they went to X gas station, and they bought gas, which is super ironic, because that's exactly what happened to me. They bought gas, and they went to a restaurant. <laughs> Um, yeah. I was going to say, I, I had my card stolen, and the, the criminals made a real bad mistake. They pulled into a gas station and used 150 gallons of gas. Mm -hmm. And they're thinking it was car after car after car after car. And it was uh, Phoenix police caught them. Yeah, good. Um, the where. If you have information about the restaurant, try to gather that up so you can let them know. Because they potentially may be able to call and ask for video. They may be able to ask for evidence from that, um, that place. And if you get that information to them soon enough, they may be able to still get it before it gets overwritten. Um, and then the why. Well, what were you doing? I went to X restaurant. I bought food. The lady took my credit card to the back. And she was back there for a little bit longer than I thought that she should be. But I don't know. Maybe they were busy. Well, that may be a clue that they can use later. It's just additional information that they can add to the report, and they can search for that stuff later. Um, so what are they going to need from you? Really, your bare minimum is going to be a date and time of the incident. We're going to need some personal information for the victim. That's you. And the business is involved if possible. So if you are victimized, we're going to need your data. We're going to need to know about you. We're going to need information from you. We're going to need your statement. So whatever it is that occurred, that explanation. 
And then we're going to need information on parties involved. Like I said, where did this stuff occur? Who's involved? Like MasterCard. It was my MasterCard or my Discover, and it was at this location, and here's the bill, and I have copies of all of this data. And having all of that pre-organized and all set up for yourself makes life a lot easier for you whenever you get into these situations. Um, let's talk about some of the answers now. Now, if you remember when we started, all the way up here at the top, I had some performance objectives, uh, things that we need to be able to identify, like uh, better ways to manage your money, staying out of trouble spots, uh, how to make the most of your money, identifying what a skimmer is, and identifying methods to easily spot scams. Let's head on all the way down to the bottom here, and we'll start going through that stuff. Actually, um, before we start with the answers, let's actually talk about uh, being a good witness. Um, so this is kind of a concept that's used in a whole lot of places. Uh, military, paramilitary organizations, all those places. Being a good witness is a very important concept. And what it boils down to is being able to provide as much information as possible to the next group that comes along that's going to initialize uh, an investigation or do something with whatever that incident was. Okay. Um, we're all adults in here, so I'm just going to say it. We have a homicide investigation team. We do not have a homicide prevention team. Okay? That's, there are people who are paid to go out and investigate crimes after they've already happened. However, when you're out there, you want to make sure that you're paying attention to what's going on around you. You want to know what kind of situation you're in and some of this stuff is just unavoidable you know I was in a car I'm a passenger I'm sitting there I'm just cruising on down the road and somebody's on their Facebook and they ram right into the back of the car and there's and what are you gonna do there's nothing that I could have physically done other than just not gone out that Sunday morning like don't go to church well I don't know what are you gonna do uh, that's a situation that I didn't have a lot of say in. However, for some of these things, you have some say in it. Is it worth it to do certain things? Is it worth it to go to certain places or to take certain risks? That's up to you to decide. Nobody else can make that decision, but you want to make sure that you're paying attention to what's going on around you, that you keep a good understanding of what's happening. Some of the people in here that have been who lost their lives, within those, those um, news articles, you'll see that other people were injured. You know, they were in the wrong place at the wrong time, and they were struck by spalling from glass, from different things that occurred around them during that incident. And there was nothing that they could have done other than try to get away. And for some of them, they would have never even known what was happening until it was too late. So sometimes things just happen. But as far as being a good witness, it means knowing what's going on around you, paying attention, and being able to write that stuff down in the event that there is a massive change to whatever order structure is going on around you. If one minute you're shopping and the next minute you hear gunfire, you should hopefully be able to switch on that switch in your head that says, okay, at some point I'm probably going to need to be able to tell people about what I saw, what I heard, what was going on around me, if I heard screaming beforehand, arguments, whatever, Try to gather up as much information mentally as you can so at the end you can provide that information to whoever's investigating this stuff. Answering uh, better ways to manage your money while shopping. Uh, we have plenty of places that you can use like Apple Pay, Samsung Pay. We went over things like PayPal. We have all these options that you can go with and depending on whatever your threat level is and as well as how much money you plan to spend certain tools may or may not be more or less effective. In addition to that, some places simply do not support this stuff. There are places that you go to and they say, we don't do Apple Pay, but we do Samsung Pay. And it's whoever that they've made friends with. I think Barclay is getting in on the action as well. So you'll have Barclay Pay, you're gonna have a ton of different companies who are all involved in this stuff. 
It is my opinion that shopping online and staying out of large crowds can reduce the chances you will end up in a trouble spot. Won't we'll end up where? In a trouble spot, in a situation. Um, can you still lose money online? Absolutely. Can somebody still commit fraud online? Absolutely. Uh, but if you're standing here and asking me, hey, uh, would you rather go to Toys R Us on Black Friday at you know, 11 o'clock in the morning to go stand in line, or do you want to sit at your computer and make some orders and maybe have some stuff on back order, and it takes all of five minutes to complete your order, and then you go on with your day? I mean, I can kind of tell you where I'd rather be. Uh, again, shopping online is another way to make your money go farther. Um, if you start looking into some of these tools, like the eBay sniping tools and the, the scripts that you can use for being able to pull uh, pricing and information data down from places like Amazon and so on and so forth. And there's a, a ton of different ways to save yourself money online. And all of them are legal ways. Uh, coupon management tools, ways of uh, aggregating for discount codes, all sorts of stuff. Uh, it's been a long time since I paid full price for anything. I mean, just a very, very long time. When you're, when you're online making these purchases, make sure that you, you look for your deals. And, you know, like I said, sometimes maybe it's better not to make a certain purchase during a certain time because it's just not the right time. Credit card skimmers. Those are devices and tools used for stealing credit card information during a legitimate transaction. Oftentimes they work as a man in the middle attack. Okay. It's your card, the skimmer, and then the legitimate transaction device and you try to use it, and the next thing you know, they're stealing your credit card information. Uh, again, back in the day, you could wiggle and you could touch and you can move stuff. Is there any way that that info can be taken just by somebody walking by you there? So that's a good, that's a good question because certain cards do provide NFC, and uh, it's, a, it's like a little radio transmitter that's inside your card, and if they, if it provides that NFC data, potentially they could gather it. Uh, that's a big problem out in Europe. Um, if you're out in Europe and you have European cards and those cards are NFC, uh, they can walk by and they can gather information about your card and there's not a whole lot you can do about it other than to use like a wallet that blocks NFC. Yep. And um, so yes and no. But again, it comes down to if you even have that. And I, don't think that here in the U.S. it's very popular. There, I think there's a handful of cards that used to do that. Like you'll see it still at like McDonald's, where you can tap the card. Um, but I really haven't seen it. I, I, none of my cards support it. I can tell you that right now. Uh, I don't have any cards that support it. And we're really rapidly moving away from that because now they're just doing it on the phone with like Apple Pay. The the uh, uh, cards with the chips in them. That does that avoid the scammer? Because it's not sliding it? Yes and no. So for it to actually be fully effective, we're supposed to do what's called chip and pin. But most places don't support that. We just do chip. So you have just chip, no pin. Uh, and then in addition to that, oftentimes you'll have these places that they'll tell you to do the chip and then the chip doesn't work, and then they tell you to slide it. So potentially somebody can still get the information from the card. In addition to that, if they're saving it in a database or something elsewhere on the what amounts to the back end, they can, somebody can still get in and get that information anyways. The chip and pin, it's, uh, sometimes I go to McDonald's, they stick the card in, and, and it, they say, here's your receipt. Other times, I stick the card in, and it'll ask me for my pin. Is that what they mean by your pin, chip and pin? Correct. Yeah. And that's safer than just chip. It's yes. It's safer than just chip. <laughs> I think it's another level. <laughs> I came in late, but uh, one thing I haven't heard you cover, and that is just simply using cash. So, granted, we don't, we can't take advantage of a lot of the stuff you've talked about here, but. <laughs> it uh, Again, I understand because it is one of those things where when I get up here and I tell you, 
everything's terrible and everything's on fire, like, yes, everybody's, everybody's unhappy. But one of the things that I did cover was avoiding cash because of the fact that if you're doing your stuff digitally, oftentimes it falls on the shoulders of the actual banks or financial institutions and they're refunding the money. If you have your cash stolen, you don't really have any recourse. So if you're carrying $500 in cash and that cash is stolen, you're not gonna get that $500 back. Uh, but if you have $500 stolen from your credit card, there's a very good chance that you will be able to recover that money at some point. Um, whereas there's zero chance of recovery really on cash. So that's why I always say, hey, don't use cash because A, most places, there's, there's very few and far between places that are going to force you to only use cash. And then in addition to that, the cash discount is pretty much extinct. We're running on very, very razor thin margins on a lot of stuff nowadays. Uh, and the competition is so fierce that prices have been dropped down low enough that really there's no place that you can go to and say, hey, I'll pay for this in cash and get a, a super deal. Even with some car places, I know at car dealerships, you know, back in the day, you could go in there and do, hey, I'm gonna pay for this car in cash and I'm gonna walk out with a killer deal. And nowadays, a lot of these places have gotten to the point where you get a better deal for financing it and paying it off in cash later than paying for the car up front. Why does everyone find out that you have cash on you in the first place? Uh, well. Obviously, it shows they didn't have it on the uh, debit card or credit card. Right? Not really. Uh, they. You go to an ATM, and I, and I didn't put any of these in here, but there's countless numbers of people who wait out at ATMs and rob you at the ATM. So you head to the ATM, and they walk right up behind you and place a pistol in your back and demand the cash that you just pulled out of the, the ATM. Uh, so if you're going to go to an ATM, you're going to That, for the most part, what I've seen so far is individuals who have gone to the ATM, they go to it late at night, things like that, when they have cover of darkness for the bad guy, so on and so forth, they place themselves in a bad position. Uh, again, it comes down to making sure that when you place yourself somewhere, you try to do it in the most advantageous way possible. Be sure in the light, with other people around, go inside, so on and so forth. But for some people, it's just not possible, which again, it goes back to, I'd rather just not go to an ATM. Uh, it's one less place that I go to that somebody could potentially wait and watch. They can see me. Uh, they can watch me go in and then wait for me at my car. Um, there's a whole bunch of different choices that they can make. And it's just one more place that I would rather avoid. Uh, and again, cash. I say no, but if you feel that cash is better for you, I mean, that's that's a, a personal opinion that you have to... to to make a choice on yourself. I can't make that choice for you. And then of course, is it too good to be true? Then it's most likely a scam. Again, click here, double click here, and you get to see Britney Spears naked. Everybody remembers that from the 90s. And nowadays, it's whatever other celebrity of the week. They've been doing that stuff for many, many years. Uh, if it looks like it's too good to be true, obviously it's gonna be a scam. Very, very few places are going to offer you a 10-day vacation to Hawaii for a dollar. Uh, all of these different scams, they just, they don't exist. They're, they're not real things, but they use them to get people to, to, to see them. Uh, one that strikes home for me, because my grandmother was a victim of this, is those individuals who would call and do the, the you know, I know you, and somebody that you knew passed away, and they kind of lead that person on and then eventually they go, oh, you must be Robbie. Oh, yeah, 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 I'm Robbie. And then they go and they continuously give information to this person until they have enough data that they can convince the person, like my grandmother, to give them money. And that's how they scam them out of cash. And I know other people that that's happened to. And um, all of this stuff is going on. It happens more in the holidays than any other time. And I just want to make sure that everybody knows about it. So holidays, great time, right? We can connect with friends, family, eat, cook, do whatever we want. But right now is the time for the bad guys to come out from under the rocks. Uh, there's drunk drivers, thieves, all number of individuals will be out looking for an easy score. 
We talked about all the, the, the little old ladies that are going to Walmart and getting knocked over at the Walmart. <coughs> We've talked about all the individuals who are out just trying to shop. And maybe they did something somebody else didn't like in their car, or they screamed out, hey, stop hitting your wife or whatever, and they lost their lives. Um, try not to be distracted. Pay attention to what you're doing. Don't make yourself an easy score. Uh, you are less likely to be able to defend yourself in any way if you're not paying attention to what's going on around you. Uh, make those smart choices. Pay attention to your actions and look for ways to take care of yourself before you even end up in trouble. Avoid the trouble. Um, why end up in that situation if you don't have to? And then, of course, if you find yourself to have been victimized, contact your law enforcement as soon as possible. Try to bring as much information about the incident as possible because even though this information may not seem relevant to you, potentially it could be instrumental in the case. Little details often fill in huge gaps in what we know as law enforcement. Uh, be a good witness. Be timely. Don't wait till the last minute. I know the credit card companies will say you have seven days to report this fraud or whatever. Don't wait until the seventh day. Uh, make sure that you're keeping track of things like the telephone number that's on the top of your credit card so you know who to call in the event of fraud. Write this stuff down. Put it in your computer so that, hey, I'm going to be carrying a Discover card, an American Express card, and I'm going to write down those numbers, and I'm going to put it in my computer, and I'm going to keep it safe, and I'm going to go out and I'm going to do my stuff, and I'm going to make sure that I keep this information. Hey, I use these cards during the holidays, and these are the places I went. Just like who was a big victim? Target, right? Target has been the victim of huge financial crime. Uh, who's another one? Home Depot. Who's another one? Walmart. Who's another one? Yahoo, who's another one? Equifax. I mean, the list goes on and on. If I name out a company name, they have probably been the victim of a huge financial crime. And that means that your data was involved. So pay attention to all those details. Keep this information so you have it for later in the event that you do need to file a, a, a claim. So let's talk about some of our final recommendations as we're starting to, to clean up here and, and bring it down. Use Linux, but don't just use Linux. Learn about Linux. Learn about these operating systems. Learn about all this stuff. There's tons and tons of information, and it's all freely available. Uh, like I said, second Tuesday of the month, we're in here talking about all this stuff. I'm actually going to take a second to talk to you about some of the stuff that we've talked about. Defensive databasing. Taught that class. If you go to my webpage, guess what? There's a video of the class. There's me being silly up there, right there. So you can learn about SQL injection. You can learn about defensive programming. What's going on with coding? What do people need to be able to learn how to do? What's vulnerable software? What are some of these terms that you're hearing about inside of the news? Uh, and for those of you who are computer literate and interested in programming, I even show examples of code where you can see like, hey, this is what a pointer is in C. This is how it's used. And then these are some of the mistakes that are made as they're writing software that leads to vulnerabilities. Um, introduction to dark markets. This was a two hour discussion where I talk about everything all the way down to narcotic sales, heroin, where are they buying it, how much does it cost, what's going on with these accounts that people are building, what are they doing with Bitcoin, where are they buying hitmen and prostitutes and pornography and so on and so forth. Tons of information that we, um, that we share here in the Phoenix Linux users group. Uh, one of my recommendations is limiting travel unless absolutely necessary. If you don't have to go out, why put yourself in that danger? Keep good records of your purchases and pay attention to your statements. Don't use cash. That's my recommendation. Some people are going to disagree with me. Uh, I don't think that you should use cash. Also, your debit card oftentimes doesn't have as much protection as your credit cards. So I really recommend not using the debit card if at all possible. Because if they steal money through the debit card, oftentimes that will lead to a situation where you may not be able to recover that money or as much of the money. Um, the credit cards are much easier to recover from. Yes. That would apply to people that can get a credit card. Correct. A lot of people can't. They have yeah. to use a debit card. And if you have to use the debit card, that's when you may want to really try to look very strongly at things like Apple Pay or Android Pay or any of these other obfuscation tools where you 
register that card with them and then you never give out the actual card. So uh, things like Apple Pay, and I'm going to click on this just for you. If you go here to Apple and you read about this and you have an Apple phone, uh, you actually register the card there and whenever it makes the purchase, it doesn't give them the actual credit card number. It uses a hash of the credit card number. So that's with the, uh, when you have an Apple phone. When you have an Apple phone. If you don't have an Apple phone, you can do the same thing, but with Android Pay. So you have alternatives as long as you have a cell phone. Uh, and then, of course, down here at the bottom, we have a little glossary with a little discussion about what's Bitcoin, what's Linux, what are skimmers. Um, and we, of course, here we have lots and lots of classes and things that we discuss and talk about and you can head to my webpage and learn all kinds of things. Uh, and we have about five minutes left. Does anybody have any questions? Anything that I can go over before we start shutting it down? No? Did I explain it all? Wow. Thanks. I've already said it. Oh. <laughs> Everybody sad enough. Thank you. Thank you for coming out and being sad with all of us. I really appreciate Happy it. Happy holidays. <laughs> Happy holidays, folks. I'm sorry. Um, I just really, really hope that, that in some way that this helped you all. I really do. I hope that, that something was in here within all of these tips, tricks, and what's going on to, to help you all stay safe during the holidays. Uh, it's a subject that's really near and dear to my heart for many different reasons. So, um, Thank you for coming out and spending your, your Tuesday evening with us. I really do appreciate it. Yes. Uh, what you're doing here at Chandler is, is phenomenal. Thank you. Are there any other law enforcement departments that are doing the same thing that you know of? Do you know? Goodbye. Thank you very much for coming. I appreciate it. Thank you. Do you know of any other? No. I don't think anybody else is doing it law enforcement wise. Not like this. That, that's, that's silly. They should. <laughs> I mean, cybersecurity professionals are kind of hard to come by. Yeah. I'm sort of a weird duck. Well, no. He's a program that's going to actually talk to me. If my friend hadn't weird. told me about it, I never would have known this existed. Mm. That, well, that's another problem. We really need to advertise more to kind of let people know about what's going on here. Because um, I do feel like a lot of people don't know what we're doing here. I have no idea. And now uh -huh. I come, I'm, I see the information is incredibly valuable. but. I feel paranoid now. That that's every day of my life. <laughs> yes. I mean, you'd be looking over your shoulder all the time. Yeah. Mm. You get the and and don't them. trust anybody. Like one of the questions I like to ask is panhandlers. See them on the corners all over the place. Uh -huh. But there's a new kind of panhandler, I think. If you're in a gas station getting gas, and somebody comes over and says, "Hey, I'm out of gas. Can you help me?" That's, that's a scam, is it not? I'm going to give you my personal opinion. You don't give those people money. That's my, that's my personal opinion, and it, it, this is my... Don't give those people money. Don't give them money. Don't do it. And I'm going to tell you, don't turn your back on them. So acts of kindness, or just forget about it. It's, well, just just give it. to your charity, not to the panhandlers and yep. stuff. Smile.amazon.com, give to your charities, do whatever you got to do. But the, the people who approach you out in the street, I don't give them money and don't turn your I back. I appreciate that. That's the only reason not to carry cash. Yep. Sorry, I don't carry cash. Yeah, okay. Yep. I just got to stop being a nice guy. A good, good, <laughs> you know, act of kindness, decent person. And There's a lot of places you can do acts of kindness that don't involve perpetuating that. Yeah, okay. Yep. I, that's the one thing I'm taking away from here that I'm not going to do anymore because I've <clears> done that a lot. Yeah, be, don't. My recommendation is not to do that. Yeah, and I will take your recommendation. And, I mean, I got took just the other night. And now that I've come to class, I heard what you said, realize what's going on, I'm going, how stupid of me. Anything else, folks? Well, well, thank you very much for coming out. I really appreciate it. Thank you.